So uh, the title of my talk uh, is about old dogs and new tricks. And there's a famous saying in English. I don't know if it translates into other languages. But you, the saying is, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And, uh, and the point is uh, that these materials we're going to talk about, have been, are, they are old dogs. They've been around for a long time. And uh, that's particularly uh, true because uh, uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, was awarded to uh, Goodenough and, and Whittingham and Yoshino for the discovery of lithium-ion batteries. And if you read about Whittingham, uh, he actually worked on uh, titanium uh, disulfide batteries. And Exxon actually manufactured these batteries in the 1970s. And so titanium disulfide certainly would qualify as one of the kinds of the materials that we're going to talk about in my talk. And so I wanted to show you where we, so we're actually, so this was a, this is, this is a, a construction photograph of the building. There's a building there now. It's a perfectly nice building. But I wanted to show you, we're actually in a pretty nice place to do science. We're right on a river. Um, the main city is over here, Knoxville, and we're kind of across a bridge. We're about two miles from the main campus, and there's a beautiful greenway. And so it's a beautiful place to, to do science. The building's perfectly nice. And uh, so two, there's two members of my group in the audience. One is Matthew Cothreen and Nan Huang, and, and this is just a, a picture of uh, lunch we had about a year ago. All right, so uh, uh, and, and I like to say that in my group we work on, and I, I made this to tease uh, uh, Anand Bhattacharya, who talks about digital synthesis. And I say, yeah, we, we also do digital synthesis. And uh, <laughs> see, we use all of our digits to do the synthesis, right? Uh, and so you might re recognize this. This is Brian's hand. Uh, <laughs> he's, our, he's our hand model. Uh, <laughs> So, and uh, so this this was a this was uh, a, uh, a put together by this is a big crucible I think it's 100 milliliters or something and Brian was talking about the glass shop and so this was a we were able to do you know, sort of a growth in, in a big platinum crucible uh, in, inside a sealed uh, environment and so they so they made this in two pieces and they can actually seal it after you put the crucible in and everything's pretty so it's really nice to have a good glass shop as Brian pointed out. And so here's my favorite science cartoon. Og discovered fire, Thorak invented the wheel, there's nothing left for us. And, uh, uh, and people kind of, this, they have this negative note, you'll hear it occasionally. Uh, even people like uh, John Horgan, who wrote a serious book uh, called The End of Science, basically. There's nothing new to be discovered. And, uh, but of course, there's another view of that. And, and as materials people, we like, like the other view better. And this was uh, uh, expressed by Freeman Dyson. And he talks about unifiers. So unifiers are kind of the Horgan types. And the diversifiers are kind of the new materials types. And so unifiers want to write you know, the, the whole universe in a single equation. And the diversifiers are happy to find all kinds of new complex uh, behaviors and that and we're and so uh, Dyson actually makes it clear he's in favor of the diversifiers in his book and so that's where I think most of us fall in. All right, so uh, it's a uh, little sociology. So physicists and chemists usually mean different things when they talk about new materials. So uh, in physics, a new material has a looser definition. Uh, so the chemistry definition is more of a unique combination of elements, a new combination of elements with unique structure is kind of what a chemist means by a new material. But physicists often will take an old material that where something new has been discovered like uh, magnesium diboride, which has been around forever, and then somebody discovered superconductivity, and then it was a new material all of a sudden, and people started fooling around with it. Um, or, or a known material like lanthanum manganite, you know, which was, uh, again, this was not a new material, but it became a new material sort of in the late 90s and, and ushered in a re uh, about 10 years of research on manganites, or more actually, it's kind of morphed into other. So that's, a, that's another kind of way to get a new material. Sometimes a nanomaterial like graphene can suddenly become a new material, right? Graphite has been around forever and, you know, suddenly graphene became a new material. And now we're talking about the surfaces 
Uh, and a lot of topological materials are not particularly new, but they're suddenly new because we've discovered new properties, new aspects about them. So a new material uh, can take on a variety of meanings. And so why would you want to make new materials for a living? Um, so that's presumably what most of us are interested in doing. Uh, and so there's a number of uh, answers. So one, it, uh, it allows you to be problem driven rather than te technique driven. So a lot of people out there have a technique and then they just measure whatever sample comes in the door. Um, whereas if you actually grow materials, you can think about the problem from sort of a higher perspective, a higher point of view. And so uh, that's, that's of interest to a lot of people. Uh, you can be cr quite creative. Um, I mean, I think Jack's talk was a good example of that. I mean, you can be very creative in your approach to uh, designing materials. And uh, this is uh, of interest to me because I like instant gratification. Uh, you can really uh, try new ideas quite rapidly and most of the time they fail, but occasionally they work. And uh, it's always nice when it works. Uh, it's, and plus it's a lot of fun. Uh, most of us want to have fun. Why not? So here's some advice. Brian gave, gave a bunch of advice. Uh, I thought it was very useful, so I'm going to give some more advice. Number one, don't believe everything you read. Just because it's in a journal doesn't mean it's true. That goes double if the journal has glossy pages. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the luxury journal. Yeah, that's another good, good title, luxury journal. Uh, glossy journal. Number two, if you have a good idea, almost certainly somebody else in the world has that same good idea. So, you're, uh, so if you have a good idea, just remember there's somebody else somewhere on the planet who had that idea is also working on it and is going to try to beat you. <laughs> so you have to hurry. If you have a good idea, you can't just sit around. Science doesn't reward good ideas unless you do something with them. Um, you get absolutely no credit for having a good idea. You only get credit if you could do something with your idea, like publish a paper. Seek out low-hanging fruit. There's a lot of, of low-hanging fruit out there, um, especially for new materials people. And uh, that's one of the advantages of people who grow the bulk materials. We can move very fast. Um, we, don't, we, can't, we don't have as much control. Some of the thin film work that Jack was, I mean, the quality of the materials is just amazing. Uh, a lot of the bulk materials aren't as good quality, but uh, it's usually, it's generally easier to grow bulk materials, I think. Thin films require a lot of work to get all the parameters right and to, so, uh, but, but they can do wonderful things with, with the thin films. More advice. Here's some quotes. If you don't look, you won't find anything. That's the kind of a Yogi Berra type, uh, but it's, it's actually quite profound, and Brian Maple said that to me a long time ago. Uh, at one of the March meetings, I forget which one. Something Brian Sales said last, last night, there are a lot of ways to screw up. <laughs> uh, and that's true. And uh, Feynman said something like that about the easiest person to fool is yourself, right? So it's easy to make mistakes. Even in a simple measurement like resistivity, you can still screw that up. So be really careful when, you're, with, when you do things. Um, uh, this is one of my favorite. I don't know who said this one. But six months in the lab can save you an hour in the library. <laughs> there, there's no excuse not to do the research, right? And know who's, done, who's worked on what you're doing, right? Really understand what's been done before, before you uh, start embarrassing yourself. If you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. So I'm going to describe, since Jack mentioned Woody Allen, I don't know who said this, but maybe Woody Allen, uh, maybe George Burns, I don't know. <laughs> All right. What is an exfoliable material? Uh, to exfoliate means to come off in thin layers or scales, and I'd like to play a little video, if I can. I don't know if people can hear it, but it's showing um, how graphene gets exfoliated. Hopefully everybody can hear it. Oops. So now it's... A scotch. Wait a minute. And gently lay it down on a flat surface. Next, 
Let's see, it's not showing my monitor now for some reason. Does anybody know what's going on? Let's see. Yeah, but I thought I had mirroring on, but maybe not. Yeah. All right, here we go. System preference. Can I drag it over? All right, let me go to the um, displays and ar arrangement. Try that. How's that? Is that going to do better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's watch our little YouTube video. So that's low-hanging fruit right there. <laughs> uh, very low-tech, very easy, and, but it was creative. And it, it, there's even a, a, a roll of scotch tape in the Nobel Museum. Uh, <laughs> true story. OK, so that's exfoliable materials. Uh, so what I'm going to do is talk about uh, a number of things that people are doing with these materials. And now, so this is where there's a lot of creativity, right? So you have materials that you can exfoliate, like graphene. And so what can you do with them that's, that's interesting and fun? And so uh, the first one is what I'm going to call single layer materials. So graphene is a single layer of, of carbon atoms. And so we can make single layers of other materials as well. And so in a lot of cases, these are going to be three layers of atoms because you need at least three layers to make the chemical composition of the, of the and you'll see what I mean in a minute. But that's still what we call a single layer, single layer of the material. And uh, so uh, what's really got this ball rolling was this particular paper. Uh, it's, and this was a couple of years ago. It's probably way over 4,000 by now. But in this paper, uh, the authors discovered that in, in molybdenum disulfide, uh, so this is an indirect band gap semiconductor in bulk. But when you cleave it down to a monolayer, it becomes a direct band gap semiconductor. And so for things like uh, optics and optical properties, direct band gaps absorb light much, much better. So if you want to harvest light, like in a photovoltaic or something like that, you want a direct band gap because it's much, much more efficient at gathering the light. And so this was a huge uh, discovery and it got a lot of people interested in single layer materials beyond graphene. And so the next step uh, was beyond just noticing that it had a direct band gap, uh, was to make uh, FET devices out of these single layers. And so a lot of work was done in a lot of places in the world. Uh, but this was one of the earlier uh, papers where they made a device, and this is a field effect transistor device, where they used a single layer of MOS2 and some contacts and a gate. This is called a top gate. Uh, there's various other geometries. You can have a bottom gate. 
but essentially you apply an electrostatic field to the device. This can move your chemical potential inside your semiconductor and you can effectively uh, uh, switch it. You can switch it from being a, an insulator into a metal uh, by, by a, a gate voltage. And so this was, this was quite interesting because these are real semiconductors. Graphene is a, is a semi-metal with very high mobility and so it's not, not necessarily the best for electronics compared to semiconductors which are more energy efficient because you can really shut them off and, and, and uh, gate them on and off much better. And so uh, that opened up a huge field uh, of semiconductor, so these single layer semiconductors and, and they mostly use uh, these materials called transition metal dichalcogenides, TMDCs, you'll have to often see these abbreviated. And so um, uh, calcogens are, are, are these atoms here, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. And so these colored, uh, various different colors are uh, uh, metals that are known to form uh, transition metal dichalcogenides. And so, um, so the structures typically look like this. You have uh, calcogen atoms in one layer, metal atoms in another layer, and then calcogen atoms in uh, the third layer here. And the metal atoms have, uh, there's two common types of coordination. One is trigonal prismatic, and one is octahedral. You can see the difference uh, here. Uh, this triangle sort of is just on top of this bottom triangle, right? So these, these are on top of each other, and here they're not on top of each other. And so three common structure types are what are called 1T, 2H, and 3R. So the one means that there's one of these uh, layers, kind of blocks per unit cell. Two is there's two of these blocks in the unit cell. Three means there's three of these blocks. And T is for tetragonal, two is for hexagonal, and R is for rhombohedral. And, uh, and you can also, and there's some differences in coordination between these. So these have the trigonal prismatic and these have octahedral coordination. And so these are the three most common structure types. And so what's happened in the last few years is that uh, a lot of the high throughput computing community has gone through and they've uh, calculated uh, from first principles uh, cleavage energies and they've determined which which materials are uh, cleavable, essentially, with scotch tape. Uh, it means they're very weakly bonded between the layers. They can calculate that quite well from first principles. And now there's huge catalogs. This was one of the earlier ones. But there's several of these papers with hundreds and hundreds and probably thousands of uh, potential 2D materials now. So all these can be cleaved down to single layers and their properties studied in a single layer form. And you'll see that even back in 2013, People were talking about various magnetic materials, antiferromagnet, ferromagnets, and so, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And so the way I see these uh, few layer materials or atomically thin materials is they're kind of the bridge between nanoscience and bulk materials. Uh, really this gives bulk materials people a chance to have an impact on nanoscience. And some of the advantages of these atomically thin materials that they have some new degrees of freedom, like the layer number, uh, and they're incredibly tunable. You can tune them with electric fields and with strain, and so they're very, they're very uh, promising to, to work with. And so uh, one of the areas that I was interested in are, are magnetic materials. And so the basic idea here is you have some sort of a, a, a calcogen or in some, some cases a halide layer and then you have a magnetic layer and then another, another calcogen layer. And they're separated, these gaps are called van der Waals gaps. So technically the bonding isn't truly van der Waals, but it, van, van der Waals, but it, is, it is weak bonding. And so one material that we looked at a lot was this one, chromium silicon tellurium 3. So this is a ferromagnet. Um, so here's a, so in the we have uh, tellurium atoms here uh, on the top and the bottom of these single layers. Uh, we, these are silicon silicon dumbbells here. There, there's uh, some uh, silicon silicon bonding going on, and then the chromiums are in purple, 
And this orders ferromagnetically and cleaves very easily. And so we did quite a bit of work on that. And our goal, uh, which we, and I'll talk about this later, which we did not achieve, was to take one of those magnetic materials, a semiconductor, and then gate it on and off and kind of hopefully kind of be able to tune the magnetism with a gate voltage. And that, that was kind of our, our dream. And nobody has actually done it with a semiconductor. Uh, one group has done it with a metal. Uh, this, is, this is another uh, Van der Waals material. So uh, this, is a, this is a 2D metal. So if you, can, you can gate a metal and you can change the TC uh, with the gate voltage. And this is very interesting work. Um, and so qu quite a bit has been done with various Van der Waals uh, materials characterizing the magnetism over the past few years. Um, this work was on the chromium germanium tellurium 3. Um, we actually like the silicon version better, but uh, I mean it's actually a little friendlier to work with. Um, so another material was this chromium triiodide. So this was uh, actually grown first by Michael McGuire, who's at Oak Ridge and Brian's group. Um, some really nice work was done in, in uh, Shaodong Zhu's group at the University of Washington. So it, it really changes. So all this was done with uh, uh, a care effect, basically, magneto-optical care effect measurements. And you can see uh, hysteresis loops. And you can see big differences between uh, one layer, sort of even number of layers, and or odd number of layers and even number of layers, and all this has been sorted out in the next in the past couple of years about all the physics behind that. So that's pretty interesting. So other systems uh, that are are quite interesting are these. They're they're similar to the uh, chromium silicon silicon tellurium three. In, uh, in this case, uh, this iron phosphorus sulfur three. This one is air stable. I'll talk in a minute. A big problem with working with these is a lot of them are not very stable in air. This one happens to be antiferromagnetic. So there's a big effort uh, out of South Korea on these systems. Uh, here's a, a, a Kataev material, uh, ruthenium trichloride. So this is also, uh, you know, a, a cleavable, <laughs> cleavable material. Uh, and uh, we've collaborated with Eric Hendrickson at Washington University, St. Louis. Eric has done, has shown that uh, you can cleave these down to single layers, uh, and they're actually fairly air stable, believe it or not, uh, which surprised me. And uh, so Abe Patsipathy at Columbia uh, has done some studies showing, uh, especially in, in uh, metals and narrow gap semiconductors, these materials tend to form amorphous oxide layers in air. So you have these, that's another reason that uh, these are, some, some of these are harder to work with than others. So wide band gap materials tend to be more stable in air, whereas metals and narrow gap materials tend to form these oxide layers. So this is just a complication. And people have learned how to get around these problems. Uh, for example, so this was, uh, again, Abe's work. Um, so what they've learned to do, and, and uh, all this technology was mostly developed by a guy named Jim Hone at Columbia. So essentially you can sort of sandwich, uh, you can use a piece of boron nitride and, and cover your sample. So here the interesting material is niobium diselenide, which is a superconductor. So you take a single layer and you sandwich it between your substrate, SiO2, and a piece of boron nitride. So that protects it. Uh, from being uh, oxidized, and then you can put leads down and do your measurements. And so there's been a lot of work on single layer superconductors as well. Um, and these are quite interesting as well. So that's that. Um, okay, so that was, so single layer materials, that, that's a one big area of research. So another re interesting area of research is to intercalate, intercalate 2D materials. Okay, so intercalation, that's what uh, the batteries work on, right? So you intercalate lithium ions in and out, and that's how you can make batteries. And so one of the famous examples of intercalation uh, has to do with where you put potassium into graphite. So you have, you form KC8, and this is a superconductor with a very low TC. Um, this was discovered, I think, in the 70s. Um, but then when uh, carbon-60 was discovered, Art Hebbard immediately, very, very quickly, uh, doped it with potassium. 
because he knew that the that the graphene would uh, would superconduct when you put potassium with it, and he he found a nice 19k superconductor with carbon 60, and so that, again this is low hanging fruit, right? He knew so Art knew immediately what to do, uh, you know when he had when he saw C60, we got to dope it with with potassium. So here's another. Uh, uh, interesting material. So this is uh, zirconium uh, nitrogen chlorine um, and so it forms this interesting layer here, zirconium, nitrogen, nitrogen, zirconium and there's a van der Waals gap. It's highly cleavable and when you intercalate lithium you can dope it electronically and it superconducts with a TC of 12.5 degrees. And I'll return to this Remember this material because I'll return to it in a little while. And it, it goes in the Van der Waals gap. Okay, so here's another material, uh, sodium uh, cobalt O2. So here you have cobalt O2 layers and sodium goes in between. Uh, and, and so we had worked on this, and this, this is, I'm going to tell the story of the screw, right? The screw, I, I, I threatened to tell the story yesterday of the screw. And this is the material we're working on when the, when the screw come in, came into play. And so, so what happens with this material is that um, a group in Japan figured out how to replace the sodium uh, or to replace some of the sodium and add water in between the layers. Okay, so you actually add water to your material and it superconducts. And so this is kind of goes with what Weiwei was saying. Nobody would have predicted that adding water to the material would cause it to superconduct, but it works. And uh, uh, so, what, so what we were doing is we were making a, a sample uh, for neutron scattering. And so what we wanted to do is put uh, D2O in between the layers. And, uh, and we did. And so we had both samples of the H2O and we had D2O. And, and we, one thing we wanted to study was whether there's any difference between them. Maybe there is. And uh, we, sent some we sent some samples to a collaborator for some high, high temperature magnetic measurements. And the collaborator was really excited because there was a tiny, tiny little signature in the D2Os of ferromagnetism up above room temperature. And uh, he, he did a lot of studies and everything, and it was there in the D2O ones, but it wasn't there in the H2O ones, and we were scratching our heads and scratching our heads. And, uh, and finally, uh, what we figured out, what had happened was, Oh, so this, this was, uh, Oak Ridge at the time would not allow us to buy D2O. Uh, I don't remember why. I think it had to dual use or something like that. We couldn't buy any D2O. So we ended up using a bottle that, we, that was like 30 years old. And we had found it somewhere at the lab. And eventually at the bottom of the bottle there we found a screw. <laughs> there was a screw that had fallen into the bottom of the bottle. And so a little bit of iron or nickel or whatever had leached out into the D2O and just, and it, it was perfectly clear, you, would, you couldn't see anything, but that was enough. Just that tiny little bit of magnetic impurity was enough to, to cause a, a signal that you could see in the squid. At, at the, yeah, so that was kind of interesting. So the squid, that's, that's another lesson. The squid is so sensitive. So if you ever see a small signal of squid, you should be very, very skeptical about uh, it being just an impurity, especially if it's close to a, you know, an iron or nickel uh, <laughs> uh, temperature phase transition. So that was. Did that end up in a loss? No, 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 no. <laughs> that that ended up just uh, just a lot of wasted time <laughs> on the part, mostly on the part of our collaborator, who didn't get tenure, unfortunately. But uh, but it wasn't because of that. Okay, ionic liquid gating. <coughs> uh, so another, another uh, big area involves ionic liquid gating. Although this area, uh, and I'll explain why in a minute. So ionic liquid gating, this is a cartoon. This is the cartoon of ionic liquid gating. So an ionic liquid 
is exactly what it sounds like. It's a liquid that has positive and negative ions floating around in it. Okay? And so the basic idea behind ionic liquid gating is you put a drop of liquid on top of your sample. So this blue stuff here is supposed to be liquid. Uh, and you put a gate voltage on top or on the side or wherever. And so if this is your positive gate voltage, negative ions in the ionic liquid go to your gate. And positive ions are supposed to sit on top of your sample. And having all these positive ions sitting on top of your sample attracts electrons in this case and it forms a conductive channel here. And the idea is you can metallize your semiconductor and form an FET and get higher densities, higher carrier densities than you could with just, say, a dielectric gate, for example. And so this, this is a cartoon. Uh, and I'm now convinced that this cartoon is never right. <laughs> but this cartoon is still out there, and this is, I, I think, a lot of, not, I think only a handful of people now have believed the cartoon is always wrong. Uh, some people will admit that it's wrong in some cases, but, other, but I think it's always wrong. And what I think ha is happening, it does work. In other words, you can metallize these things, but I think what you're doing is actually intercalating hydrogen into the materials. Hydrogen, hydrogen, yeah. I think you're putting hydrogen into the materials uh, and that dopes them. So it does work. And this, this is the paper that really uh, got everything going. Essentially, uh, you do an uh, ionic liquid gated 2D material. Here's our uh, you know, zirconium, nitrogen, chlorine material again. Uh, they put a drop of ionic liquid and they were able to make it into a superconductor with a gate voltage. And so this really attracted a lot of interest. And uh, it seemed for a while that ionic liquid was a magic bullet that you could do almost everything with. And, uh, and actually I should remind the audience about a guy named Jan Hendrik Schoen. Um, does that, does that, who knows who Jan Hendrik Schoen was? Probably a few people, yeah. So Schoen gave ionic liquid gating a bad name, uh, sort of, you know, in the early 2000s. Uh, this was a guy at Bell Labs who, who wrote, I don't know how many nature and science articles, and it turned out that all the data in those, in those papers was just fabricated, made up. And it, and it took probably five years for it to be sort of fully discovered and but uh, some, of the some of his papers involved using ionic liquids, and so nobody touched ionic liquids for like six or seven years after that. Uh, but all this stuff is real. People can reproduce it, um, it but it doesn't work the way the cartoon uh, tells us it's supposed to work. So here's some work uh, coming out of uh, China and Rutgers uh, on a, uh, this, this material, tantalum disulfide, undergoes a sort of complicated series of charge density wave transitions. And uh, so you can kind of tune the phase diagram with gate voltage. So and there's even a superconducting dome here. Um, so that's, it's really beautiful work. It, and, and it does, all the sinic liquid gating works, it just doesn't work the way the cartoon says it works. <laughs> so. And we tried some ionic liquid gating back on that uh, sample that I showed you earlier, ruthenium trichloride, which is close to a cation spin liquid. And, it, and again, I, our goal was to tune the magnetism with a gate voltage, and it didn't work. So I have yet to, we have yet, we tried a lot of different 2D magnetic material semiconductors with ionic liquids. I ha we haven't been able to make any of them work. And I'll, later I'll talk to you about uh, a way around this I think will work. Okay, so that was ionic liquid gating. So um, here's another one called stacking. So early on it was realized that if you have uh, various 2D materials, you can kind of stack them together like Legos and make new materials, right? And this is uh, kind, of, kind of what uh, Jack wants to do uh, but, but on a much smaller scale. So he can make centimeter size samples. These are micron size samples. <laughs> and so uh, he can do RPES. In order to study these, you need to do nano RPES, right? And so uh, the advantage of these is that you can uh, quickly stack them together and uh, make 
make a lot of cool stuff. And the group in Columbia, actually this is open to user proposals. If anybody wants to go to Columbia and use this, this was part of their MRSEC, and so it had to be, it's in part in some kind of a user facility, and so you, uh, technically people are allowed to use this. So this is the stacking facility at Columbia where they have, you know, all kinds of interesting, uh, and, and this is a few years old, they probably even have robots now. So the talk was to kind of automate a lot of this stuff and kind of make it uh, have robots doing it. And so uh, you can stack various 2D materials together and try to make some new and interesting uh, quantum materials. And so there's uh, some preliminary work was done uh, using uh, MOS2 where you just uh, twist it. So these are so these are called Moiré uh, systems where you, you take two materials and you can adjust their, their lattice registration and you have uh, the Moiré angle. And a couple of years ago, uh, this breakthrough of the year involved uh, magic angle graphene where you just take two pieces of graphene, stack them on top of each other, and that at certain magic angles they become uh, superconductors and there's like a mod insulating phase and so you get all of all of sort of the physics of high TC superconductors and in, in this kind of two layers of graphene and so that's been a really hot topic the last couple of years and so um, so that was exciting and so but there's a lot more to the stacking uh, besides just putting Van der Waals materials together you can imagine putting uh, 2D materials uh, on other items. Uh, in this case, they put graphene on a uh, yttrium iron garnet substrate, right? Yttrium iron garnet uh, right here is, is a, uh, a f uh, ferrite. Um, so it, it's, it, it's a ferri magnet, uh, but it's a very good oxide, very well. They, people can make really high quality films of, of yttrium iron garnet. It's used a lot in spintronics. And so when you put graphene on top of it, you can measure uh, an anomalous Hall effect in the graphene. So you've proximitized, you can, approxi you can use your proximity effect in the yttrium iron garnet to, to kind of make the graphene magnetic. And so um, something that Eric has been working on, so, so Eric was the one that worked on the ruthenium trichloride on the nanomaterials. So he made a sandwich with ruthenium trichloride and graphene. And what he discovered was that there was charge transfer. He was able to metallize the ruthenium trichloride by, by charge transfer from the graphene to the ruthenium trichloride. So this is really pretty interesting result. And uh, some theorists have kind of picked up on this. And so this is Rosa Valenti's group. And she, she finds very similar to what Eric had had discovered uh, so she can understand this from first principles. And so uh, what I think is going gonna, is gonna to happen now is that uh, what this is going to do is open up again these old dogs, these old materials. So people in the 70s and 80s, and this goes, this is like Millie Dressel House worked on this, you can take magnetic materials uh, like these uh, okay, iron chloride and cobalt chloride and you can intercalate these into graphene and so we know that graphene can make these nice gated uh, FETs right and so I predict that if you start growing these and then make your uh, devices out of these uh, graphene magnetic layer graphene uh, materials you can make these will be gateable magnetic devices and so uh, I think that's a really promising area for research and so this is this is kind of again what I mean about old dogs and new tricks so this would be an old dog and doing a new trick okay so let me talk about uh, vapor transport which is how most of these materials are grown and so the basic idea uh, with vapor transport is that you uh, have um, a reaction going on inside the tube. So this is a, a sealed silica tube. Do they get to seal silica tubes as part of their training? Uh, they see it done. They see it done, okay. So you seal the silica tube with, uh, you basically have your starting material. 
Uh, and then you have a trans what's called a transport agent. Uh, so your, your starting material would be A, and your transport agent would be B. And there's a reaction going on inside the tube where you have a reaction between your material, your starting material, and the transport agent. Uh, and it forms this gaseous phase here, AB. And so what happens is, is uh, at, at T2, you, you, you have some equilibrium going on. And then at T1, you have another sort of equilibrium going on. And because the temperatures are different, uh, you end up depositing material at one end of the tube or the other. And so, um, let me, I think I have more interesting, more on the next page. Okay, so let's think about this for a minute. So here's what's going on. You have A plus B gives you AB. So this is your chemical reaction. So if this, if AB, if this reaction is endothermic, right? If it takes, if you have to add heat to get this reaction to go, Right, you'll see that at the at the hot end of the tube, right, you're going to end up uh, forming. It's kind of you're going to have a excess of AB at this end compared to the colder end, right? And at the colder end, you're going to have an excess of of this of this these materials. So the the net result is you're going to end up slowly depositing material from one side of the tube to the other. And if the, if the reaction is endothermic, the crystals grow at the cold end of the tube. And if the reaction is exothermic, they grow at the hot end of the tube. Most materials grow at the cold end of the tube, but there's a few materials that will go the other way. Uh, if it's, and so some of the common transport agents are iodine, bromine, chlorine, HCl, ammonium chloride, hydrogen, water. There's a whole bunch of them. And Essentially, you want to have enough transport agent in the tube to have about one bar of pressure from the transport agent. You don't want to use too much because you can explode your tube if you're not careful. Right? Anytime you put volatile things in a sealed tube, there's a chance the tube will explode. And uh, So again, this is an old dog. These transport agents, this trans chemical transport uh, has been around for a long time. This is from 1961 and it was already a kind of a review article then. Uh, so this is, there's nothing new here. Uh, it's, it's got, it's a very gentle way of growing crystals. Um, generally gentle is better than rough or, or you know, you want to grow, generally uh, you want to grow crystals at, the lo at a lower temperature and using a slower technique. Gentler is better. Um, so there's a whole bunch of sort of guild hall knowledge that people have accumulated over the years about how these things work. Uh, there's a lot of empirical evaluation. You try different. Uh, you can try to calculate, but to be honest, uh, the chemistry of what's going on in those tubes is never particularly well known. There's all kinds of interest, you know, all kinds of species in there. You can go to the chemical databases and try to model it. It's generally easier just to just put a few tubes in the furnace than to try to model with the... Uh, but you can try if you want to. Um, so it's good to have a large crystalliz crystallization chamber. Uh, uniform gradient should be there. Um, larger diameter tubes are often better. Um, you know, there's, there's different, different rules of thumb. So the person uh, in my group has been doing most of this. Her name is Amanda. She just recently graduated. But she's been growing a lot of these magnetic uh, cleavable uh, materials. Um, and these are all grown by vapor transport. But she's the one who put together all these slides for us. And uh, so here's some of the tricks that she worked out over the course of her research. Um, essentially, she, she liked to start uh, with, with the stoichiometric compound, and she would press it into a pellet, uh, and then put it into the uh, bottom of the tube. And I think Brian mentioned this a little bit, but one of her, so if you have any volatile materials in your tube, you have to be really careful when you seal your tube, because you can easily, if you volatilize some of the iodine or something, what happens, it'll, it'll kind of devitrify your tube. Uh, it'll, so you have to keep the bottom of the tube cold or cool 
so there's various ways to do it. Um, I think Amanda liked to just use the wet paper towel approach. Uh, another clever way of doing it, five minutes, okay, I'm almost done. Another clever way of doing this is to uh, take one of the compressed air cans and if you turn it upside down, you can actually freeze things with it. So you can quickly freeze the bottom of your tube and then seal it. Uh, you can put it in ice water. There's all kinds of ways. You can find your favorite way. But you want to keep the bottom of the tube cool when you're sealing the, sealing the tube. Um, all right. So yeah, so she did a lot of prep work, making sure she had the right phase to start with. She found that being very important. Um, so you put your powder and your transport agent at the bottom of the tube. Okay, you want another trick she has is to you want to protect the walls of your tube so the powder doesn't get onto the tube. Again, if the powder's on the tube when you go to seal it, uh, it's bad. So you want to protect the walls of your tube from getting powder on it. So you can just pour your powder or your pellet down the tube, your wet paper towel. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so you need a temperature gradient. You can pick your tube length. So, um, so you can use a two-zone furnace and, and it works well. But we've, uh, we generally have a lot of these cheaper single-zone furnaces. So these, these have a built-in temperature gradient. Um, the, the, the ends are cooler than the, the middle, essentially. You can tune the gradient a little bit by putting, you could put a piece of fire brick in the end or something like that. And you, there's, there's games you can play. But what you want to do is profile your gradient with, with a thermocouple. And so you can get a good idea of what the gradient inside your furnace is. And you can, and you, can you know, sort of calibrate it. Uh, and these furnaces are very cheap. And we've had good luck with them be honest, and they're much cheaper than a two-zone furnace. I guess if you're just buying one furnace, you might want to buy a two-zone, but if you're going to buy 20, you might not be able to afford 20 two-zone furnaces. So we, we, set, we put our tubes a little off. We don't want them right on the heating elements, so we generally put, set them up, up a little bit. Um, so you kind of sit, you, know, you program the furnace, that to, you, you slowly warm it up, um, and the crystals can, can take up you know, from between four days to a month. I've even seen three, four months in the literature. Some of these um, spinels, some of these uh, calcogenite spinels can take three or four months to grow. I'm not sure we can go three or four months without a power outage. <laughs> you know, a thunder, all it takes is a thunderstorm. So, uh, but Dave, it's an interesting point that three or four months. I mean, is there any guidance or theory guidance that they have to think that they should be waiting? Well, I think you can or check it. Yeah, you can check it out. You can see tiny crystals after a month and then say, you know, keep going. yeah, you know, August is coming up. We're in Europe. You know, we can yeah, let it go another month. You know, <laughs> why not? And then, you know, uh, you get some pretty gratifying results when things work. You can see lots of beautiful crystals at the bottom of your tube. And there's various troubleshooting uh, approaches you can take. Uh, I, won't, I won't go in, I'm running out of time. But, uh, you know, there's lots of parameters you can fool around with. You know, you can change the amount of transport, you can change your temperature, you can change the tube diameter. Um, yeah, so another, so another uh, trick is to, you want to, uh, it's sometimes good to clean the tube with nitric acid. Um, nitric acid doesn't dissolve the tube very much, but it does dissolve a little bit of the tube. I don't think you need, I mean, if you really want to dissolve the tube, you can use HF, but we, we don't work with HF. Um, nitric acid seems to do a pretty good job of just sort of reducing the number of nucleation sites. Another trick is to uh, kind of reverse the temperature gradient for a while and then switch it back. That can sometimes help. Um, 
So and there's some of the materials that were grown in the vapor transport. And that's all. Thank you.